Hi, my name is Anthony, and I have the privilege of leading worship here at Mark Church. Wherever you are, we just want to say thank you so much for tuning in. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe. There's an awesome word from God for you. Today, I want to take you on a prophetic journey through the book of Exodus, and we're going to look at Moses and the life of Moses. And I'm going to show you how um, somebody, someone who maybe we wouldn't have looked at to do anything for God was used to do something in a major way for God. Find somebody say, God has a plan for you, even if you don't have a plan for you. Uh, find somebody else, say, God has a plan for you, even if you don't have a plan for you. Okay. Go to Exodus chapter 2. We'll start at verse 1. Let me give you some context and set this up. Pharaoh, we don't like Pharaoh. Let me just say it that way. <laughs> I, feel like I'm, I feel like I'm talking to kids. So I'm just, we don't like Pharaoh. Pharaoh is uh, suppressing the people of God, and the reality is, is he's decided to put labor and, and work on the people of Israel. The issue is, somebody, tell somebody say the issue is, the more work he puts on the people of God, the more fruitful they become. I want to tell you the reality of how good God is in your life. Just because the enemy is trying to form a weapon doesn't mean that the weapon will prosper. Just because, God, because the enemy is trying to uh, uh, attack you and has things against your family doesn't mean that those things are going to withstand. Tell somebody say, you have the power of God. So we see in this, in this section of this story, Pharaoh is trying to put pressure on them, and here's why. Because they're starting to outnumber his army. Just like the body of Christ is outnumbering the kingdom of darkness. You want to know why the enemy's mad at you, why he's coming against your family? Because the kingdom of God is starting to outnumber the kingdom of darkness. The devil don't like you. You know why he don't like you? Because your whole family going to be saved. Your co-workers going to be saved. Pookie and Ray Ray, John John and Bobo, all of them going to be saved. And for that reason, the enemy don't like you. Oh, well. All right. And so he decides to commission his people to kill not just firstborn, firstborn boys. Now, at this point, he's just like, take out all the boys that are born. All right. Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Now a man of, man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. That's why I say three months. Three Interesting that she hid him for three months. But when she, had, when she could hide him no longer, she got a, a papyrus basket. Let me stop right there. Um, there will come a point and there will come a day in your life when the thing that, you, that God has been wanting to do in you starts to show and you can't hide it no more. There, there will come a day that God's been growing something in you, whatever it looks like. And maybe God's been saying, like, keep that, keep that under wrap. But a day will come where it will outgrow you. Because it's time for it now to come forth. But when she couldn't hide it no more, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. God bless this word. Don't let it fall on deaf ears. In Jesus' name. If you believe it, say amen. amen. So she, the mom throws Moses into the water, and here's the reality. Water often re uh, uh, symbolizes uncertainty or a barrier between blessings in the Bible. If you see water, the majority of the time, it represents uncertainty or a barrier between a blessing. Like, remember when God split the Red Sea so that they could what? Walk through it. Or God stopped the flow of the Jordan so that they could come through it, and then after they came through the promised land, he crumbled all of the people. All right, all right. Y'all here? In verse 4, he says, his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Notice, Moses' mother drops him into the water, but Moses' mother 
doesn't watch to see what happens once he's in the water. Instead, his sister looks after him in the water, but the mom decides, I ain't trying to watch this. See, some of y'all don't want to watch what will happen because you can't stomach not knowing how the outcome is going to be. But tell somebody, God's track record is perfect. Open your eyes. Oh, I feel that. Open your eyes and see that God's plans will come through. There is nothing that God has started that God will not continue to move in and through your life. I don't care if you have a wayward son or a wayward daughter. They will be saved. It doesn't matter if there is sickness in your body. God will heal your body. Tell somebody, say, open your eyes. <laughs> open your eyes. Woo. Can't imagine being a mom, putting my child in the Nile River. See, I, I feel like y'all so deep, y'all could. Me, I couldn't. <laughs> I mean, can, can, can you imagine being a mom and you're the one who was up all night with this kid? You were the one praying over this kid for three months. You were the one feeding him, bathing him, wiping him. I'm so glad that season is about over for us. Whew. But you're the one responsible for everything that's been happening to that kid, and now you've got to put him into the river. Could you do it? She said no. In other words, it's in God's hands now. Look at my eyeball to eyeball and say, it's, it's in God's hands now. She had to put the baby, Pastor John, in the river. Let me say it this way. She had to put the baby in the flow. Because rivers aren't stagnant. Rivers flow. I'm preaching already. See, see, see sometimes God will make you release the thing that you love early out of your hands so that you could see the destiny in his hands. Tell somebody, say, your baby is way better in God's hands than your hands. I can't get no help in here. Your business is better in God's hands. Your kids are better in God's hands. Your husband, they get on your everlasting nerves, is better in God's hands. I feel like somebody was like, God can keep him. <laughs> I want to preach for the next several minutes, and I'm going to let you go. From this title, I'm going to put it in the form of a question. Do you trust me? Ask your neighbor. This is on behalf of God. Say, neighbor, do you trust God? Do you? And, and, and wait for an answer. Yes. Some, some, yes. Yes. yes sir. Do you trust me? Can you hear that in your spirit? God's asking that today. Do you trust me? Do you trust me with your body that may, that may currently have sickness, but it won't always have? Do you trust him with your marriage that may be broken right now, but it won't stay broken? Do you trust God with your business that may seem like it's going in the opposite direction in, 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 in finances, but God will and turn that thing around? Do you trust God? Verse 5, it says, then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe her, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slaves to get it. Verse 6, she opened it. And saw the baby was crying. <laughs> and she felt sorry for him. This is, the one, this is one of the Hebrew babies. <laughs> was my cry not good? Like, what? <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> 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 
He said, I sound like a goat. <laughs> okay. Y'all be serious. I lost my place, man. The baby was crying. Verse 7. This next scripture is what I call a divine interruption. Say divine interruption. interruption. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get uh, get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? This is crazy. Notice that the person who is asking is Moses' sister. This is crazy. And then this is what Pharaoh's daughter says. Yes. Go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. Interesting. I had to give up the thing I love only to watch the thing I love come back to me, but it didn't just come back to me, it came back to me with interest. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. I want to prophesy to some people in the room who've been trying to figure out how God's going to do it. Don't worry about how God's going to do it. Just know by the time it gets back into your hands, not only will it be good, but there's interest being... a. We call that compound interest. Ah. I don't know who this is for, but I feel like the Holy Spirit's been telling me, you have been losing too much sleep over something that has already been worked out. Did you forget? He's Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. There's nothing that you have given that God has not already seen it already be good. He works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his what? Purpose. See, he works all things together, which means the good and the bad has to at least touch once so that he can place the bad under the good oh you missed it you missed it you've been looking at your enemy all wrong you need a footstool I'm preaching. Eric I'm preaching right now I wish I could preach the necessity of an enemy for just a moment Listen, your enemy can't take you out, but God will use your enemy to bless you. He prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. All right. Uh. See, see, as long as you have nothing but saints around you and you never have an enemy coming against you, then that means you're no threat to anything. As long as you're no threat, then there's nothing that... I need somebody to get that the next time the enemy shows up. Just say, you ain't nothing but a footstool. You ain't nothing but a step ladder for me to get to where God has for. Take 10 seconds and give God praise on that right there. You ain't nothing but a step ladder. You came in the form of cancer, but you ain't nothing but a step ladder. You may have come in the form of a disease, but you ain't nothing but a step ladder. You may have come in the form of an aggravated kid, but you ain't nothing but a step ladder. You may have come in the form of manipulation and rejection and abandonment, but you ain't nothing but a... Your enemy will pay for all of it. 
Notice the very thing that she gave up. God gave it right back with compound interest. Your situation is way better in God's hands than it is your hands. Uh, why? Because God made your hands. When you give God back the thing that you love, you know what you're giving God? You. You missed it. You missed it. You missed it. Because there's nothing that you have that God didn't bless you with. And blessings come from the Lord. And so when God says give it back, all he's asking for is not the thing. He's asking for you. Tell somebody, say, God is knocking on your door because he wants you. Y'all going to get this in your sleep. It's better in his hands than it is my hands. Which means when God says, give it to me, and you have to wait for God to work it out, you need to know it's not just about trusting God. It's about how you trust God and how you wait on God while you're waiting. If you, anybody ever worked in like the restaurant business, just lift your hands, um, all two of you, okay? Um, I tip really well because, you know, um, but, but if you've ever been a, a, a waiter or a, wait a waitress, you know, how you wait on someone will be the result of usually a really good tip, okay? You can either wait in complaining mode for God to change it, work it out, shift it. Or you can wait in praise mode. You can wait in a, in, a, in a position, in a posture of rest. Or you can wrestle with God. Either one. I, I choose not to, to wait on God. But I choose to wait. Wait on God. Like, I, I choose to put, position myself to serve him while I Wait on him to work it out. Why? Because the thing I gave him, if he wants it back, there's a reason he needs it. Your God moves forward. There's nothing he's asking for that he really needs because he's not interested in duplicating anything. I'm preaching right now. So if he's asking for it, Either he, it's either he's asking for it because it's protection or he's asking for it because he wants to multiply it. Okay. 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 That's why some of y'all can't move forward in your finances. Because every time God asks you to step out in faith in your finances, you're like, but God, this is my money. Why are you acting funny? You didn't make the trees. It, it, it's, not, it's not yours. See, it's amazing what we're willing to give up as long as it don't affect our wallets. Like some of the ladies in the house, y'all give up your man really quick. Lord, take him. <laughs> Change him. Rearrange him. Kill him and bring him back. I'm just, I'm being facetious. A little bit. So that's why I say trust God. Okay. Uh, the Bible never says that Moses' mother went looking for Moses to figure out what would happen. It just simply says the sister went to find out what would happen. I believe Moses' mom was like, the God who is faithful to give me this child is also faithful to sustain this child even though it's no longer in my hands. Tell somebody, say, it's in God's hands now. <laughs> now that it's in God's hands now, you need to return to the faith you had when you first, before you got what you had. Okay? It's in God's hands now. If the doctor said they can't do anything about it, now it's in God's 
hands, okay? If the school system is bugging out, tripping out on your kid, that's okay. It's in God's hands now. God's track record is so perfect. You can look back on generation after generation after generation, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. You can see his track record is perfect. His hand is too, too powerful. His resources are too vast. For those who lean truly in to the blessings of God and trust God, you don't have to go a day without bread from God. You may not have everything you want, but you will have everything you need. And the mama said, amen. She gives a child back to the Lord, but she chooses not to watch what's going to happen. Psalms 139, 13 says this, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together where? In my who? Where did, where did you get knitted? That means your child was in God's hands before it ever touched your hands. It's always, you, you everything you have has always been in the hands of God. If you go down, it says this in verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I would imagine that Moses' mom was like this. If God gave me this child, not only will God sustain this child, but I don't have to see God work it out to trust that God's done it before. If this one, if, this, if Moses' mom was like, my mom, my mom would have been singing. My mom, my mom don't wait till it's done. My mom starts singing. I, I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I grew up with a singing mama. Anybody else grew up with a singing mama? Like, I grew up with a mama that on Sunday mornings, we wake up super early. She turned the music up loud. That loud being, get your butt up. We going to church. But I also saw my mom in situations when storms rose up. I also saw my mom turn that music up. I, I never understood then, but now I understand it now. See, what she was doing is in storms, she knew that the enemy knew how to talk louder than the enemy when storms happen. So she would crank up the word of God so that the word of God would be louder than the storms that were talking to her head. You need to position yourself when you're waiting on God to do something. Turn the word of God up. Begin to worship in spirit and in truth. Don't worry. Just worship. Instead of complaining, praise God. Give God a space that he can inhabit so that his spirit can move and change things for your life. Instead of being in complaining mode, be in praise mode. Storms are inevitable. I think the day has come where we stop looking at storms bad. Because everywhere I read a storm and Jesus is in it, the storm that made you get on the boat is the storm that Jesus walked on the water in. Are you looking at storms the wrong way? Because the very thing that you and I would get on the boat for, Jesus got off the boat to walk in. <sighs> see, 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 storms shake people who only acknowledge Jesus for Jesus, but for those who recognize Jesus is Lord, storms are opportunities for God to do the inevitable and for God to do the thing that seems impossible for those who believe in Christ Jesus. Just so you know, the devil believes in Jesus too, but the devil doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because Lord simply means owner of my life. So when a storm comes, I don't just look at him as savior. I look at him as the owner of my life and say, if this storm is happening, you're responsible for me. If this is happening, you'll take care of it. If you'll take care of the sparrow, how much more will you take care of the two? All right. 
See, 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 the response in the room is, is, is the response of a people who've been letting the storms toss you to and fro. But today is the day. I would, I would wish, I wish 200 people, even right now, would say, even though I'm walking through something, I will create a place of praise to show the enemy that the voice of God is way louder than the storms in my ear. The praise of God will be louder than the issues in my ear. God's worthy of it all. No matter what the doctor says, God's still worthy. No matter what my friends think, God is still worthy. No matter what my business is doing, God is still worthy. No Go ahead, 10 seconds, create an atmosphere of praise for God to come in and shift things. 10 seconds. Where the worshipers at? Where the worshipers at? Eight seconds. I'm looking at this storm differently now. I'm looking at my storm differently now. I'm looking at my issue differently now. He's not just my Savior. He's my Lord. Yeah. Tell somebody, say, he's got you. God's got you. It's, it's in his hands now. It's... It's too late to get it back. It's, it's in his hands. I mean, it's, it's, it's done. It's done. Your situation is out of your hands. Now you got to trust the hands that it's in. She threw the baby into the Nile River, never looked back. The baby came back, and then she gave the baby back. And if you read the story, we know that God uses Moses to deliver the people out of bondage. It's amazing that the woman that delivered the baby, the baby turned back around and delivered her. That's why you can't hold your baby like that. Because God's birthing something on the inside of you that will one day step into your world and deliver your whole family. Was oh, pray. That's why you got to pray over your kids. That's why you got to say you will be saved. You will love Jesus. Because I don't know the day I got to give you to him. But I know one thing, that the God who started is faithful to complete it. I need some mamas to stand up right now and pray. Your kids will be saved. Your household will be saved. Your family will be saved. Don't stop praying. Don't stop believing. God can shift it. Yeah. I can shift it. He will shift it. He will shift it. He he will do it. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. He will do it. Just want to say, he will do it. He will do it. Some of y'all missing it because y'all so ready to get this fried chicken. But I'm trying to show you how to look at your storms differently and know that once it's in God's hands, God's hands are the best hands that your situation could be in. What other hands would you rather put? All right. Oh. This reminds me of a story. Stand on your feet. I'm done. I'm done. I'm about to let y'all go. This reminds me of the Abraham story. The story of Abraham. Really quick. The Lord speaks to Abraham and he says, hey, give me your son. Sacrifice your son. The Bible says that Abraham goes and he tells his son, we're going. We're going to the mountain. And they go up the mountain. And he prepares the sacrifice. And he gets ready to sacrifice his own son. Reminds me of something. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And the moment that he's getting ready to slay his son, an angel comes and he says, stop, don't touch him, don't do anything to him. God just wanted to know, do you still fear him? See, you keep putting it in your hands because you don't fear the Lord. 
Not fear and trembling, but fear and honor. Fear in the reality that God's hands not only are bigger than your hands, but God's hands made your hands. See, when I truly fear the Lord, I'm okay trusting God. When I truly fear the Lord, ladies, give God your husband and keep your husband in God's hands. Husbands, give your, give your wife to the Lord and keep her. Give your kids to the Lord and keep your kids in God's hands. Tell somebody, say, it's in God's hands now. And see, when I truly fear him, I let him know you're not just Savior, but you're the owner of my life. That means you're responsible. When you walk out here today, you need to know you didn't just accept him as Savior. You accepted him as one who is Lord over your life. Sometimes God just takes the thing that is in your hands to know. Is the thing in your hands bigger than me and you? Do you love the thing in your hands more than you love God? Husbands, do you love your wife more than you love God? Men, do you love your job more than you love God? Wives, do you love your husbands more than you love God? And just for the single people in the room, just so you know, once you get married, you still got to take time for God. Because he's jealous even in your covenant. Oh, I'm preaching. <laughs> My prayer today is that not only would we trust God's hands, but that we wouldn't be so familiar that when God speaks an unfamiliar thing, we don't realize it's God. It's God. It's how you know it's God, because you're not that good to make it up. You ever had an idea and you're like, that was a really good idea. No, 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 for real, like, have you ever had one of those ideas where you're like, I ain't even going to trip. That was pretty good. It wasn't you. It was God. And you know it's a good idea because you go tell your friends and your friends are like, hmm. You know what that hmm means? You ain't, you ain't, you ain't as dumb as I thought. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm joking. Trust the Lord with the thing he's put in your hands. And if he says, give it back, then be willing to give it back. If he wants to give it back to you, I promise you, he'll give it back to you. I'll give you this story and then I'll let you go. Pastor Ashley and I, in two, well, three years ago, four years ago now, we were in Winston-Salem where we used to live and we were serving a church as executive pastors. And Pastor Ashley had got a dream. She woke up out of, out of her sleep and she's like, I, I had a dream. And I was like, well, duh, like that's normally what happens when you, when you sleep, you have, you have a dream. She's like, no, 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 I had a dream that our pastor went away for eight months. And I was like, what? She said, I think it has something to do with his health. The next day, someone say the next day. The next day, I got a phone call that our pastor had had a stroke. So we went back. We looked, at, looked them over, looked at the process. You know how many months it was going to be? Eight months to recover. Here's what you don't know. is during that same time, I was wrestling with God on whether or not we were going to start Mark Church place you're in, right? Uh, by the way, over 600 people in two years have come to the knowledge of Christ. We were trying to figure out what, what do we do? We, we need to move to Fayetteville to start. We call it the runway. The runway is when you come into a city and you start to like introduce yourself so that people know that you're here, right? 
We needed to be in the city, but we couldn't come to the city because God had told us that we got to now be still. You ever thought you heard go and then God says be still? We decided we're going to stay and we served the house for eight months as executive pastors. I'm going to go ahead and tell y'all, if God had not given me those eight months, I would not be a good pastor. I needed those eight months for God to grow the thing in me that had become dependent on me and not him. And I said, I said, God, we, we need to get, we need to get moving. But I, like, do you not want us to start marked church? He says, no. I just wanted to know, would you give it back? I got to the eighth month of my pastor getting well. And I began to pray about marked church i said god because 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 this is when the pandemic was breaking out that means that means the money started acting funny we were losing our salaries and i said god do you still want us to to plant marked church you know what he said nothing you want to know why he didn't say anything because he wanted me to trust the first thing that he said he never said that we wouldn't plant Mark Church, but he had a process for me to go through to be a better pastor before we launched it. Some of you have mistaken the silence of God for God not wanting you to do something. God just ain't trying to repeat himself. If he said it, his silence is because he wants your trust to grow, not his volume to. Keep it in God's hands. Tell somebody to say, do you trust? It's messages like this that we want to continue to take all around the world. Will you consider partnering with the vision of Mark Church by texting Mark Church to 77977?